Allora, benvenuti a tutti per questo, in questo terzo incontro di un maggio particolarmente intenso per l'Associazione di Cultura Classica e, e qui abbiamo anche una novità quest'anno, la prima conferenza in lingua inglese, quindi è un bellissimo esordio, magari ci sarà modo di continuare ancora. Grazie, ringraziamo Claudia Gandini che che ha avuto il contatto con il relatore Tobias Yoho. Poi passerò direttamente la parola a lei per la presentazione. Io voglio soltanto eh, ringraziare nuovamente il, il liceo Volta e il dirigente, saluto anche da parte sua, per lo spazio concessoci, questa possibilità di utilizzare il Google Meet della scuola e saluto da parte naturalmente dell'Associazione di Cultura Classica. Ricordo, eh, così se qualcuno poi dovesse... Eh, di sconnettersi prima del nostro prossimo importante appuntamento di venerdì prossimo della notte nazionale del liceo classico. Quest'anno sarà in questo momento dell'anno inconsueto, in una modalità inconsueta, però veramente lo sforzo che, ehm, che stanno approfondendo tanti alunni e tanti professori è grande, per cui speriamo che ci sia anche una partecipazione a questa attività che peraltro è anche ho avuto modo di vedere qualcosa già e sono molto interessanti, insomma. Va bene, allora vi auguro buon ascolto e passo la parola a Claudia Gandini per la presentazione del, del nostro relatore. Grazie. Grazie, sono, diciamo, sono molto contenta, un po' emozionata di poter uh, essere riuscita diciamo, a portare a termine questa, questa idea. Che, a cui tengo personalmente perché mi, mi ha consentito di tenere un po' insieme i due mondi dei miei ultimi anni, cioè la, il liceo e l'Università di Berna, che mi ha accolto nella volontà di proseguire gli studi con, uh, con il dottorato di ricerca. E appunto proprio a Berna ho conosciuto Tobias Siocco, il nostro relatore di stasera, che è lì assistente, lui il dottorato ce l'ha già, ha studiato tra Oxford e gli Stati Uniti conseguendo il dottorato all'Università di Chicago e adesso a Berna, a Berna come assistente, ma eh, coniuga la ricerca anche con l'attività didattica che segue con entusiasmo, quindi anche lui mi diceva è molto contento di poter parlare ai nostri ragazzi stasera e penso che sia un'occasione anche per, uh, per poter vedere che i classici hanno sempre qualcosa da dirci anche per i giovani, anche per i giovani ricercatori. Ne abbiamo avuto la prova due settimane fa con l'archeologia e la storia antica, ma vale anche naturalmente per la filologia, la letteratura e anche per autori che ci può sembrare sono talmente noti che eh, sia già stato detto tutto. E vedremo infatti che questa sera alcuni brani tra i più noti e importanti di, eh, di Tucidide, della guerra del Peloponneso di Tucidide, e di Tucidide, Tobias si è occupato eh, a diverso titolo, tra cui anche eh, contribuendo all'Oxford Handbook of Tucidides e ha adesso eh, una monografia in corso di stampa per Oxford University Press ehm, sul, sullo stile Tucidideo dal titolo Necessity and Style in, in Tucidides. E, quindi sono contenta di lasciargli, di lasciargli la parola appunto anche nella, nella volontà di mostrare che, che ancora molto c'è da dire, anche i testi classici ancora ci dicono, ascoltandoli però con la testa e con il cuore anzi. E ringrazio appunto anche per questo tutte le, le colleghe di, di lettere, di inglese, gli studenti che, che vedono hanno partecipato numerosi e la, il resto del pubblico, soprattutto le colleghe che con entusiasmo hanno sostenuto l'idea di provare una conferenza anche, perché no, in lingua inglese. Vi ricordo a questo proposito che chi volesse può attivare ciascuno per se stesso i sottotitoli dalla barra in basso, non sono una traduzione ma comunque vedrete proiettato sullo schermo le stesse cose che verranno dette in inglese e che alla fine sarà possibile porre domande o curiosità magari anche da parte degli studenti sia in inglese che in italiano. Buon ascolto. Ok, buonasera a tutti. Anche da me. Um, per cominciare vorrei ringraziare uh, Claudia Gandini e le sue colleghe dell'Associazione Cultura Classica Sezione di Como per invitarmi a tenere questa conferenza su Tucidide. <coughs> Ringrazio anche voi tutti 
particolarmente gli eh, studenti del eh, liceo classico che eh, avete preso tempo eh, per ascoltare eh, questa conferenza stasera. Purtroppo devo dire che il mio italiano eh, davvero non è sufficiente per tenere tutta una relazione in, in italiano, quindi devo scusarmi per parlare in inglese d'ora in poi. Ok, so now <coughs> we're switching to English. Um, I'll tell you briefly what I have in mind um, for this talk. It, the talk has basically four uh, main sections, and each of them focuses on one crucial passage in the work of Thucydides. Um, I start out with uh, Pericles' funeral oration. That would be the first part. In the second part, I, part, I look at the plague, and I'll try to show how the plague in many ways responds to what Pericles says in the funeral oration and challenges um, it or calls it calls some of the claims into question. Well, we'll see exactly what is happening later. Then I'll jump ahead to the Sicilian expedition, the, the beginnings or the eve of the Sicilian expedition when the Athenians are uh, deciding that they will undertake it in the first place so at the beginning of book six. And I'll try to show that the situation then uh, recalls in some important ways the situation in Athens before the plague hit, i.e. at the time of the funeral oration. And I'll conclude in the fourth part by looking at the very end of the um, Sicilian expedition, uh, the imprisonment of the Athenians, the surviving Athenians um, in the stone quarries in Syracuse, which um, I try to argue that we, we, which as I will try to show figuratively so this imprisonment in the stone quarries means something like a revival of the conditions of the plague so that's that's an outline uh, of what I've planned um, the whole thing should last about not more than an hour uh, 45 minutes to an hour um, and so I guess I'll try to start the PowerPoint presentation now. Let's see whether this works. Um, okay. So now you should see my screen. Um, and could I just ask Claudia to confirm that everything is working? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I confirm everything so right. Okay, excellent. Very good, thank you. Okay. Um, so, you know, as you, as you all know, the work of Thucydides is uh, basically combines two very different modes. Uh, one mode is that in which he relates um, the events of the Peloponnesian War, often uh, in minute detail, but very much focused on martial events. So how did the various expeditions work? Who did what? Um, so a strong focus on that, on events. And, you know, as many of you will know, modern historians have uh, uh, admired this, this, this intense focus on causality uh, immensely in the work of Thucydides. That's the one mode. The other mode is uh, one in which Thucydides either himself or more often through the mouth of his speakers, or, or um, yeah, let's say through the mouth of them, um, rises to certain kind of vantage points um, in which he um, tries to probe or the speakers try to probe. It's not always clear whether Thucydides agrees or not with what they say, into the underlying forces that drive events or uh, that stand behind them. Um, so the funeral oration is, of course, such an example. Many of the other big speeches, but also in Thucydides' own voice, the um, excursus on the plague, or for instance, the excursus on stasis. Um, and 
So to begin with, um, I will look at one of these high vantage points, the funeral oration of Pericles. Um, so just to remind ourselves what, what, what is a funeral oration, what happens there? So at the end of each year, um, the Athenians gathered in, a, in each year that they were at war in a solemn public ceremony to bury the remains of those who had fallen in war. Um, so they usually were burned when you know they were abroad fighting in war, um, wherever this happens, but then the remained, remains were brought back to Athens and there was this grand state funeral uh, with a dignified procession and ritual lament. Um, and it culminated in a speech given by a distinguished Athenian um, in praise of those uh, who had fallen uh, to in, in the name of Athens. And so Thucydides gives us one of these funeral orations, and this is the one at the end of the first year of the Peloponnesian War. And um, uh, Pericles, uh, who um, very much thought that Athens should fight this war, is the one uh, uh, the speaker chosen to deliver this speech. So the, the, the part of this funeral oration that has, um, is most memorable and most famous is the first part, which is the praise of contemporary Athens. Um, um, this is a bit unusual for funeral oration because Normally it was like that, that it contained a praise of the ancestors as a kind of first section, and then the second section switched to the praise of the fallen soldiers. Now Pericles will praise the fallen soldiers, but the praise of the ancestors is quite short, and instead there is this extended and um, dignified praise of, of, of the Athens of his time. And what Pericles thinks is so unusual and unique about Athens at the time is that the Athenians have an ability to combine in their personalities and in their city um, character traits that stand in an antithetical relationship and that usually, for most people, can only be had as either one or the other. So people might have, I don't know, people might be very courageous, but then they're not maybe not very reflective. For instance, that's one of the pairs that Pericles has. But the Athenians are always both. They, 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 they can always combine these polar opposites. And so I would like to begin um, by looking at some of these predications of polar opposites uh, that Pericles ascribes to the Athenians. So the first one that I've uh, chosen to show you is that um, Pericles says the Athenians, they are concerned with equality, they are of course a democracy, but that doesn't mean that, you know, they are egalitarian in the sense that they don't recognize distinctions. No, they recognize excellence. Um, and so you see the first point here at 237.1, he says that they, they have equality before the law. He also says that, you know, he also implies that, uh, you know, each Athenian can vote, each vote counts the same. Everybody can run for office. Everybody is involved in the state. So there's not a ruling class um, that uh, where the decisions are made. All Athenians are involved in their in their um, in their city. And um, you know the specific example I have here is that in you know in in, in lawsuits there is really equality before the law. And the it's not the case. He says or he implies that the rich are preferred. Uh, over the poor or something like that. Now, at the same time, he says, we give preference to those um, whom we choose for office, 
who really have shown personal excellence. Um, right, so, and you see here these terms that I've underlined, uh, axiosis on, and uh, oidokimeo and arete and uh, rotimao, right? Um, so, uh, worth, virtue, uh, 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 fame, preference, the Athenians recognize all these things and are egalitarian at the same time. Yeah? So that would be my first example. Um, the second example would be that the Athenians in their, um, both in their private life and in the organization of their state, emphasize freedom. And uh, they have a lifestyle that is uh, relaxed. And he says, you know, we don't put on sour faces if you know, our neighbor chooses to do as he pleases um, uh, and to pursue his personal interests or pleasures. No, we're tolerant. We let them do as they, as they please. So there is this space for personal freedom. And of course, the implication is always quite unlike the Spartans, right? Where, the, where there are rigid structures that, you know, um, that constrain the individual and so on. Yeah? At the same time, right, the, then uh, this freedom, of course, might have as its, as its downside a kind of anarchy. Um, but Pericles says, no, we comply with the orders of our magistrates and we respect both the written and the unwritten laws. Yeah. So um, personal freedom and kind of obedience uh, to those who have been elected and to the law both come together. A third point is um, the combination of the rootedness of the Athenians in their own in their own land, combined with kind of openness to the world and a certain cosmopolitanism. So it, the Athenians were famous, or were very proud um, of the fact that they were autochthonous, right? So they've been always living in the same land for generations, and that they hadn't been subject to migrations, like the Dorians and, and, and most other Greeks. The Athenians were always in Attica. So there is this connection with the soil. At the same time, they are not uh, self-enclosed. Uh, they don't just look at their land. No, they are open to the world. Um, they, um, uh, he says, we make our land, our city, accessible to everybody who likes to see it. And we encourage the influx of, of goods from every from every land. We don't want um, we don't we don't do what the Spartans do, who regularly um, drove all foreigners out of their country. Right? That's not what Athens is. Athens is open to the world and even encourages people to come and look at their city. This is a point that maybe I can I can deal with um, more quickly. So you know he praises the ease of Athenian life, all the beautiful things they've created, festivals. You know, the, of course, the great theatrical festivals. Um, uh, he will have in mind the nice private houses they built, the public uh, uh, um, sacrifices and games. So there is this this festive lifestyle. No severe military drill as the Spartans have it, right? Who, who, who kind of practice for war day in and out. But when war comes, the Athenians are especially are, are exceptionally brave and never shy away from any dangers, right? So again, um, these these opposites come together. Okay, now we have the we come we get to the most uh, famous quotation from the entire speech, and I will look at that a bit in greater detail, Pericles says, um, uh, you know, you, you'll all know that, right? Philokalumente gamet oiteleas kai philosophumen anoi malakias. So, Philokalumen, we love beauty, met oiteleas with, it's a bit hard to translate, with economy maybe, with restraint, without access. Literally, the word means cheapness. So we love beauty with restraint, 
and we love wisdom literally right we philosophize without softness um now you know if you it's it's kind of right the the, the thing the, the the quotation has become a bit of a cliche um but i think it really it 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 it's worth looking at the style of this passage closely because the language encapsulates um the form of this passage encapsulates basically all that pericles is trying to do in this in, to, to say about athens in this part of the funeral oration so if you look at philo kalumen philo sophumen you have right you have this this parallelism you have right almost it's a word play basically right so the beginning and the end of the two verbs are exactly the same only the middle kal and soft they're different then you have a strict parallelism of word order in the two um in the two in the two phrases right this is the first one this is the second um right you have first the verb five syllables then you have a preposition meta and annoy and then you have an abstract noun each with four syllables right so this very very precise correspondence you have coordinating particles tekai right which balance the whole thing out and he combines a positive preposition meta with a positive term oitelea and a negative preposition annoy um, with a negative term malakia and so the result is, of course, two positives, right? Because if you combine a negative preposition with a negative term, minus times minus, basically results in plus, right? So there again, a parallelism. Without softness, an anoi malakias basically means with vigor, right? So there are all these parallels. But if you just have parallels, it you know it becomes kind of too schematic. So he also puts in antitheses or opposites. The first one, right? The words are not the verbs are not exactly the same, but one is love of beauty and one is love of wisdom. And then the two verbs are um, uh, set in apposi opposition with the prepositional phrases combined with them, right? Loving beauty is combined with economical restraint. So what does that mean? Well, if we love beauty too much, that might lead to something like excess or exuberance or, or things like that. So we need some restraint, right? And then you get this balance. So love of beauty in itself is good, but it could might be overdone. So we get this term, this prepositional phrase, which, you know, puts a counterweight next to it. Same with loving wisdom, right? If you're very much given, I guess, would be the suspicion to reflection and intellectualism, well, you might not be able to deal with the hard challenges that life in Greece may bring, right? War and these things. But in Athens, this love of wisdom is does not bring softness, but comes with, I guess, the implied opposite of toughness. And then, so, right, so there we have again, we have these opposites combined and holding each other in, in, in balance. And then, right, we can continue. We have the positive preposition with in parallelism with the negative preposition anoi, right? So we might say it's syntactic variation. But then we have the positive term oiteleias with the negative term malakias. So we might say, okay, there we have semantic variation. And so you see the basically the the language enacts parallelism and at the same time opposition and antithesis and these two things are so closely intertwined that you basically you can't separate them and in the very language of this passage he um you know he makes vivid he he encapsulates uh what the Athenian mentality is about, as according to Pericles. Now, we could talk about this passage still even more, um, but I don't want to overdo it, so I'll skip over this part. Um, but I would like to show you um, this statue, which probably many of you will have seen. Uh, 
uh, this is the uh, uh, Doryphoros of uh, Polyclitus. Um, and um, the best copy of this statue, the origin, of course, lost, which was in bronze. The best copy is in uh, the marvelous uh, Museo Nazionale Archeologico in Naples. And that's what you see here. And this statue, now in stone, in marble, or originally in bronze, as I said, you know what Pericles is doing in words, this statue is basically doing in the medium of sculpture, right? Because you have this um, you have this um, combination or this playing this this interplay, the so-called contrapposto between um, the right leg, right, which is the leg on which he stands, the engaged leg, and the left leg, which is relaxed, the the so-called free leg. And then with the arms, it's the inverse, right? You have the left arm that holds the spear, which is not here, and the right arm that hangs down, um, you know, in a kind of relaxed, loose way. And at the same time, you could say, on the right side, you know that the right leg is straight and the right arm is relatively straight, but the left leg, although relaxed, is bent. And the left arm, which does work, is active, is also bent, right? So here you have exactly the same thing. You have uh, symmetry through opposition, as it were, right? Um, okay. I think, so I, I think you're getting the point, right? There, there would be a few more examples, um, which I think I'll skip. I'll just go to the, the, the climactic, um, um, the, the climactic pair, um, which is basically, if I don't misremember, the last pair of opposites that he ascribes to the Athenian character. And that is the combination of autarky and versatility. So I'll just read you the translation. I say that in my opinion, one and the same man among us, each by himself, might prove his personality, tosoma, right? Which literally means body, but can mean something like person, individual, prove his personality to be self-sufficient, autarkes, with a view to very many kinds of pursuits, um, a P placed, ade, and with greatest versatility combined with grace. Kameta shariton malista oitra pelos. Uh, what does it mean? It's a bit hard to write and just throw it at you to understand what he means. And the, 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 it's, it's a kind of involved sentence. But so he claims we in Athens, every individual has achieved self sufficiency. So independence, as it were, from the outside world is not dependent on, I don't know, external powers, whatever they are. Um, and with the self-sufficiency, each person can imply, apply himself to all, to many, very many kinds of, so to do many things with it, right? Why is that important? Because, well, for one thing, self-sufficiency is something that the Greeks would have associated with the gods. And the gods, they basically, they, you know, they are, they are happy on Olympus. They don't need much, right? They live in eternal bliss. But that may also mean that they lack this human impulse towards action, right? Uh, and if they engage in action, well, it's never so serious as it is for humans, for whom, you know, action is, can be a matter of life and death. So, the Athenians are, have this autarky, this self-sufficiency, this independence, but that doesn't mean that they just sit there and rest, but they engage with the world, right? And do so in a kind of elegant spirit, right? With, with kind of beauty and elegance, I guess that's what he, with the versatility combined with grace, right? Okay. So these two guys will have to skip over too. Um, now, the funeral oration also, this is my last point about it, always um, features 
an exhortation to the living, right? Basically of the pattern, okay, take those men who have fallen, who have given their life for Athens as your, as your model. And Pericles puts this exhortation into the words or into the idea that he wants the Athenians, the survivors, to become the lovers, the arastai of the city, right? So he, th he says those who survive, now I summarize, must be willing to defend Athens with all their might. And now the important phrases, beholding daily with a sense of wonder, the dynamis, the power or capacity of the city. Kai arastas gignomenus autes. And by looking at the city and uh, at its at its dynamis, becoming her lovers. So what's the idea here with the um, looking at the dynamis? Um, so the thing is that many um, interpreters think that um, what this term refers to is really the military power of Athens. And that's surely included in it. But, you know, after this involved praise of the city, um, I find it hard to believe that, you know, after Pericles has emphasized this so much, um, the, 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 the beauty and excellence of Athenian life, that this isn't what he now wants to call to mind, you know, what the Athenians must, must defend and, 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 and fix on their mind in order to be able to defend the city. And so um, Hermann Strasburger has um, written in one of his pieces on Thucydides that dynamis in Thucydides is often not just military power, say in a military sense, but more something like capacity, the ability to do things. And that can manifest itself then in, in, in different spheres. So I, I would argue that that is primarily what Pericles has here in mind. All the amazing things that Athens can do. And what I would say supports that is that he puts this phrase kath hemeran in there, looking at it every day. So it's something that the Athenians have in their everyday experience. And the phrase every day, referring to everyday experience, comes up twice in the praise of Athenian character, right? That precedes in, you know, in two phrases that I have at the bottom there of the slide. Yeah. So I would say that the idea here is that the Athenians must look at all the things that Athens makes possible. This is, of course, also military power, but it's not just that. And that's what he wants them to fall in love with. And falling in love with, now, of course, the word behind that is eros. And eros is uh, the Greek word for uh, intense, um, not least sexual passion. And these strong connotations are surely there. So it's something very strong that they're supposed to feel. At the same time, Eros is for the Greeks um, often associated with an urge towards action, you know, towards the attempt to realize something. Um, and it's often this, it's the striving after that which is absent from you, which you don't have, and which you um, want to um, obtain because it's so important to you. And Think of Plato, think of the symposium, where Eros is what carries you up um, towards the realm of the ideas and the reflection of the idea of beauty. Um, I mean, Pericles is talking about more worldly things here than the remote realm of ideas. But I do think Eros here has some of this, um, these connotations in it, right? striving after this ideal that Pericles has described to the Athenians that their city represents, but that always needs to be re-achieved, um, re right? Pericles does not talk about an ideal 
that is, you know, a mere fantasy because he always, his statements, he always refers to what he thinks Athenian life is like. So it's not, he's not putting that in terms of, I wish it were, were like that. But so it's not an ideal that is totally remote from reality, but it is something like, uh, that's a phrase that one scholar of Thucydides has used, Nicole Leroux. It's something like the Athenians higher self. And that's something they have in themselves and that they can achieve and their city can achieve, but it constantly needs to be reactualized. It's not something that is simply present. Yeah? And I think this urge towards reactualization, that's what Eros, or be, becoming an Erastes of the city, suggests in this passage. Okay, now we get to part two, the plague. Um, you know, it's uh, one of these um, amazing Thucydides moments, how, you know, he gets from, basically within three sentences, he gets from the funeral oration to the plague. The first sentence is that he says, okay, this was the, this was the ceremony and they all scattered. And after Pericles had ended speaking. Then the next sentence is the Spartans then invaded Attica next year as they did every year and ravaged the countryside. And the third sentence is, and at the beginning, very early in this, during the Spartan invasion, the plague started at Athens, right? So you have this um, immense juxta juxtaposition of the highest and then the, the kind of darkness that comes with the plague. And I know to use a, 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 um, a term that um, uh, Karl Reinhardt has uh, 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 coined with regard to uh, Aeschylus' Oresteia, right? The, where he says, you know, the, 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 some of these scenes juxtapose image and counter image. Yeah? And I think that applies here too, right? The image, first image of the plague, now the counter image, of, uh, sorry, the funeral, now the counter image set against it of the plague. And this is not just, so this is, might be true on a general level, but it's in fact very specific because uh, Thucydides recalls what Pericles said in the funeral oration in this excursus on the plague in various places. So for example, you have uh, in the plague, uh, sorry, in the funeral oration, it's of course this heroic death for the city of the fallen soldiers, which brings them eternal fame, right? There you see the terms are underlined, uh, ageron, unaging, aemnestos, or forever remembered, right? So it's it opens up the horizon of eternity, uh, eternity for each man individually, literally for with regard to each private person, idea. Yeah. Now, what happens in the plague? Um, he writes, it an annihilated all alike, that's in the xun ere, right, the prefix xun, and even those who were treated with all medical care. So everybody alike, there was no distinction between, you know, heroes and, and you know, ev everybody else everybody was was um, exposed to the plague. And he writes, people died like sheep, right? So they died in, in nameless herds. So this idea of the individual that is immortalized um, is, is no longer possible when the plague rules. In the funeral oration, he stresses, um, he stresses the Athenian concern with law, that the Athenians have uh, internalized their respect for law, both the written and the unwritten laws. We already saw some of that. And now he says the plague marks the beginning of greater lawlessness for the city, anomia, right? And then he says, no fear of gods or law of man was able to rest um, restrain, sorry for the typo there. Uh, the Athenians anymore, right? And fear of gods and law of men, well, those are the written and the unwritten laws that are not respected any longer in the plane or, or lose, their, lose their power over people. Okay, we can maybe skip that point. Um, of course, the 
Funeral oration in Greek, right? It's the Epitaphios Logos. And Logos is what Pericles himself calls it at the beginning. Logos in the sense of a speech. And then Thucydides in the plague writes that the character of the disease was um, Kreison Logu, right? Strong, stronger than Logos. Now, probably the immediate sense of Logos there is it was stronger than, it, it was beyond what we can describe in words. Maybe it was also beyond what we can rationally comprehend or articulate, right? Because Logos, as you know, always has this, these two sides. It's, it's rational articulation in words. But of course, you could, you know, there, there it may also be this undertone. It was stronger than the logos we just heard, right? It was stronger than um, what Pericles could, um, could, could, could impress on the Athenians in this speech. And now here is the the, the closest correspondence. Um, we saw, right, each Athenian proves himself, according to funeral oration, a soma autakes, a self-sufficient individual. And now in the plague we hear, and it turned out that no bodily constitution was self-sufficient. And the word for bodily constitution is soma, and for self-sufficient, it's, of course, autakes. So, right, it's the double meaning of soma, which can mean body or here bodily constitution, but then, of, then also individual, right? But Pericles says, each Athenian is a self-sufficient soma. And now we hear no soma was self-sufficient. Okay. And finally, um, we might say, you know, that this high, this eros as this striving, this intense striving after the ideal, what has remained of that? You know, the word eros doesn't come up in the in the speech, but he says about the Athenians that they thought, thought themselves in the face of the plague entitled to seek enjoyments that were quickly available and produced pleasure, considering, the, considering in equal measure their lives and property as transitory. So it seems that, you know, eros has just has, has shriveled, has shrunk, to this concern with immediate pleasure, just getting pleasures out of life. So it's no longer this striving to, to after an ideal, but it's, you know, fast enjoyment because, you know, uh, if we don't enjoy ourselves today, tomorrow we might already be dead. Okay. So, Well, maybe we can we can talk uh, later about what this juxtaposition means. I'm not sure that it means that the funeral oration is totally invalid, um, but I think it shows us how fragile that um, noble Athenian achievement that Pericles celebrated really is. Right? It's to combine uh, in this delicate balance these opposite, the, the strong opposite forces, as, as we saw, right? The, each member of these antitheses in the funeral oration, they're all charged with energy and to, to keep them together. I mean, that's a tremendous balancing act. And when then something as harsh as the plague hits, you know, it's, it's very difficult to maintain that, right? These, these high peaks, they, are, they seem very fragile. And when uh, reality shows its harsher face, um, it 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 seems to be hard to maintain them. So that's that's I think in the direction that I would go. Yeah? But as I said, we can we can come back to that later. So um, okay, now we get to part three. Um, so we talked about funeral oration and plague. And now we come to Sicily, or the decision in favor of the Sicilian expedition. So by that time, uh, just to remember, uh, remind ourselves, um, Athens is officially um, at peace with Sparta, right? It's the so-called peace of Nicias. Um, 
and um, be because it's being concluded in, in, in 421 and pa Athens didn't get it. Basically, the, 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 the peace was more in favor of Athens than of Sparta because it turned out that despite the plague, despite all these losses, the Athenians managed to um, withstand the Spartans and then they had this spectacular success at Pylos. And so eventually both parties were worn out, but the Spartans even more than the Athenians. And so um, the, this, this peace was concluded. And so at this point, in this phase, um, you know, in the year 415, um, so I guess, I guess 15 to 14 years after the funeral oration first hit, uh, sorry, the plague first hit, um, the Athenians uh, take to this idea that um, they want to um, undertake this expedition um, to Sicily, uh, nominally to help their allies there, uh, the Aegisteans, the but Thucydides um, makes clear, he says that in his own voice, that their real goal was to um, conquer Sicily in its entirety. Um, and Okay, what happens is that the Athenians have this um, this big assembly where they try to work out should we um, undertake the expedition or not. And Alcibiades is the person mainly in favor and driving the whole enterprise. Nikias is skeptical and Thucydides um, gives us this, their speeches. And now what um, becomes clear in this section is that at this point, the Athenians have recovered from the plague, right? This is what Nikia says in his speech, you see it there. And this is then also what Thucydides in his own words says uh, a little later. Uh, the, the city had just recovered itself from the plague and the continuous war. And What goes along with that is um, maybe recovery sounds a bit like, um, you know, only just or, or, or you know, just about recovered. But in fact, Athens is back at a height. Before the plague, um, Thucydides says that Athens had reached a height, an acme, or the verb is akmazo, right? The city was at a height and not yet suffering from disease. He says that before the funeral oration. And when we come to the Sicilian expedition, Alcibiades, who encapsulates the spirit of Athens at the time, says that he is at a height or in his prime, Akmazo. And um, Thucydides himself says um, that the Athenian soldiers who went to Sicily, i.e. the, you know, in terms of strength and manpower and so on, they were at a height again. And again, the words are the, either the noun Akme or the verb Akmazo. Um, so we might say, okay, despite the, the, the plague and, and all these, um, and, and, and the horrors that it brought, Athens is back to where it were. So are we back at the ideal of the funeral oration? Now it's interesting that Alcibiades, um, in his speech um, in favor of the expedition, talks about the balancing of opposites. And what he talks about is the the opposites of old age and youth. Now, these are not exactly the terms that Pericles uses, but what stands behind old age and youth is for youth, something like, uh, you know, uh, adventure and, and activity and ambition. And for old age, prudence, caution, um, you know, self-discipline, these kinds of things. And, you know, when we think of that, then we are actually not far from what Pericles uh, talks about in the funeral oration, right? That the Athenians can combine both, they, they can be prudent, but they, they, they also have this immense activity in themselves. And, you know, as you see here, so I've, I've printed in bold um, the, 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 the words for, for old age and youth, 
And, Peri and Alcibiades talks about that as in our customary cosmos, right? Our customary good order, we could say. But of course, cosmos uh, always has these associations of um, or connotations of you know beauty, something well ordered, something also uh, aesthetically pleasing um, in Greek, and that also seems like you know uh, a hint back at the funeral oration. So Alcibiades seems to suggest that um, that this ideal somehow is back at Athens. Now, I, I put here maybe a bit uh, very kind of uh, bold, uh, in a, uh, very boldly, that this balance is in fact fake. Um, so it's not, it's not real. It's just Alcibiades rhetoric. Why do I think that? Well, for one thing, Alcibiades, um, you know, doesn't talk well about old age in his in his speech. He says the skill of the city in all sorts of areas will grow old, engerasestai, if you listen to Nikias, right? So there is a danger that you know if you if you listen to the old man, uh, Athens will become, I suppose, senile. Yeah? He could have used a different word there, of course, um, and. So this doesn't seem like a balancing of opposites, but this seems more like conflict. Um, and you know, and then the second quotation is Thucydides speaking, and there he reports how the Athenians, in fact, voted for the expedition, and he emphasizes that you know those who weren't in favor, they kept still, they didn't voice their skepticism or opposition. Because they worried people, you know, they would be considered as illoyal towards the city. So that's also that you don't have the sense of, you know, different forces cooperating, but it's in fact one force, the force that Alcibiades stands for, um, putting down the other. Yeah. Now, you remember Pericles talked about uh, or, or, or called upon the Athenians to become the Arastai of their city, and words related to this um, to this root eros also come back in the Sicilian expedition or in this in this debate uh, on the eve of the expedition. So one is in the speech of Nicias, and he says that he worries about these younger men and he makes a counter appeal to the older men. And there again, we see this opposition between young and old. And what he says is, they should not be madly or disastrously in love, dus erotas, with absent things, ton upon ton, which is what the younger man may have happened, may, may have suffered. So dus eros, is a is a bad or a mistaken or evil eros, right? And that's what he thinks has befallen uh, the um, the youngsters among the Athenians. And dus eros is a is a strong um, poetically colored word. It's not very doesn't occur very often, but in one important passage it occurs in uh, Euripides' Hippolytus, and you know. You also see here, there's also you no know, concern with what is absent. And then madly in love. This is what we turn out to be for any glittering something that gleams on earth. Yeah. Um, so we have this, we have this mad eros, and we have the striving after what are this desire for what is absent. And in the Hippolytus, this is a daimonic affliction that Venus brings upon you. Yeah? Um, and of course, dus eros, it's clear, right? The word has uh, threatening connotations. So somehow this vocabulary takes us into the sphere of, say, tragedy. And it's interesting that the other phrase, the other occurrence of eros, also has a tragic uh, uh, echo. Because Thucydides writes, this is now again Thucydides talking himself, the moment when they vote for the expedition, he writes, uh, and the desire to sail, eros ekploisai, fell upon the entirety of them all alike. 
And this word phalapon is an epi an epithet, so empipto. Um, fall upon um, can be used in military contexts, can be used of, of heavy bodily um, or psychological afflictions. That's the term he uses. Now, the exact same combination, eros and empipto, occurs in um, the Agamemnon of Aeschylus. And it falls upon the Greek army before Troy when they're about to sack the city, this, the city of Troy. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's here, it's, 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 um, it, it's coined as a, it's, oh, it's um, couched as a negative injunction, right? Let not the desire fall upon the army to ravage what they must not. But of course, that's what happens. And that brings the curse of the gods upon them because they will, they will ravage the shrines and um, uh, uh, desecrate the possessions of the gods at Troy. And this echo now, right, of an eros that befalls a collective and that has terrible consequences, um, also afflicts the Athenians now. Okay, so we get to um, the last part, the very end of the, exp uh, the Sicilian expedition. And what you see there is that, I mean, you'll remember the Athenians, of course, the whole thing goes terribly, terribly wrong. Um, and um, they end up being defeated. Um, Alcibiades is long gone, right? Um, uh, for reasons we don't have to go into now. Uh, Nikias um, is taken prisoner, uh, surrenders himself and is executed. And the the, the surviving soldiers are thrown into the stone quarries uh, at Syracuse, which you can still see today, where they are imprisoned. And now the way in which Thucydides, he, you know, he takes stock and describes this, the, the conditions of imprisonment. And this recalls um, in various ways the conditions of the plague at Athens. So for instance, you have spatial constriction both there in the imprisonment, right? They found themselves in a large and narrow, in a hollow and narrow space. And uh, also in this next passage, he emphasizes the narrowness of space, right? As they're crowding there in the stone quarries. And the same happened at Athens or made the plague at Athens especially terrible, right? Because the Athenians had moved the entire population of the city, um, uh, sorry, of the uh, Athenian countryside inside the city walls because of the Spartan invasions. And so they couldn't go out. And of course, under crowded conditions, um, um, uh, a disease spreads much more easily. Thucydides emphasizes the stifling heat, pnigos, that afflicted the imprisoned soldiers. And the corresponding adjective, um, pnigeros, right? is also used of um, the Athenians during the, um, during the plague, right? In these crowded conditions where they live in, in, in huts that are stiflingly hot. There is lack of, you know, the most basic accommodation in both places. In the stone quarries at Sicily, they don't have a roof. And during the plague, houses are not available. Again, right, because of this transfer of the population inside the city. Um, hunger and thirst afflict the soldiers that are imprisoned and uh, in like manner the plague uh, caused the patients an unquenchable thirst and there's also an allusion to hunger that I maybe um, pass over for now. Then both of them are characterized as reversals, as so-called metabole. Um, since I don't want to go over, I may skip that too, right? I mean, this idea of the reversal uh, in the, when they're the, in the imprisonment, the weather conditions shift, days are hot, uh, nights are cold, and that reversal um, oppresses the soldiers, actually right, causes them to die, as you see here. And the plague also has the character of a reversal uh, because it comes so suddenly, right? It, um, here the word itself is used, and then 
uh, Thucydides emphasizes how the how the symptoms occurred suddenly. People were healthy uh, in in perfectly good health. Suddenly, they get the symptoms of the plague and die. And then a very close echo: the heaps of corpses. Right at Sicily, corpses ton necron had been piled on top of each other. Eb alelois. And during the plague, corpses necroi, right? Corresponding word of dying people lay again on top of each other. Um, okay, both, sorry, now I went too far. And both at the end of the Sicilian expedition and during the plague, hopelessness prevails, right? You have this word anelpistos uh, strongly emphasized. Um, during this final stage of the Sicilian expedition. And here you also have it of the plague. Okay, now let me just try to wrap these things up. So we saw how we came from um, basically the funeral oration, it's challenged by the plague, but then Athens at the beginning of the Sicilian expedition is seems to be somewhere back where they were before the plague hit and at the end of the expedition you know even through um, only figuratively but we have conditions again that recall what the athenians suffered during the plague um now the thing that i would or that i think is interesting or, or worth stressing is the role of eros in all that yeah, we saw, or I tried to argue, that um, in the funeral oration, Eros is this striving that keeps the Athenians, um, you know, going after this ideal and reactualizing this ideal time and again. Now, Eros comes back at the eve, at the beginning of the Sicilian expedition, as we, as we saw, but there is something different, right? It's no longer this, this it's not this noble striving, it's, it's a desire for more. And it's uh, something disproportionate and something that will not listen to reason and counter arguments and so on. And of course, this eros is what drives the Athenians into the terrible situation in which they find themselves at the end of the expedition. And so, I guess I'd like to say that Thucydides tries to show that you know there is there is a that the, there are two faces the, 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 the Janus faced character to a power like Eros. It can achieve the greatest things at Athens, but it can also lead to the greatest disasters. And the fact that you know, in a way, what enables the most noble things also can cause the biggest disasters or lead to the biggest disasters. Seems to me a very tragic insight, right? That basically the highest and the lowest in a way are related and touch each, each other or maybe are even the same thing encapsulated in Eros. And um, so I guess in this, this um, these scenes that I've juxtaposed, that's, I guess, what I would like to conclude with, that, um, you know, Thucydides calls attention to this, this tragic aspect in the Athenian character, right? It doesn't mean that Eros is a, is, is, is a, is a bad thing, right? It also enabled these amazing things, but it also has this destructive potential. And so when he describes these conditions at the end of the funeral oration, right, he, he basically, he puts this, uh, you know, the result that came from this before our eyes and, you know, makes us ponder that, that, you know, from the very high, the Athenian fell down to the very low again. And the force that drove them to do that well, was Eros, which at the same time had lifted them so high. Okay, so this... I would conclude here. Um, thanks very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, Tobias, for your intervention, for your coming here. Quindi se qualcuno avesse qualche domanda o curiosità, dubbio, adesso potete alzare la mano, scrivere nella chat o, come dicevo prima, anche in italiano. I probably have a question for you, okay. if I may. So if you were saying that the reversal of fate of essence is a switch from positive errors for the city to do zeros, uh, is that due just to men and not to fate or to the gods? Mm -hmm. And um, so probably to see this is giving a different analysis of human nature and his relationship to, with fate as um, different from a contemporary theater, especially tragical theater. And that may probably lead you to the plug and the death of, this, of Pericles, and so the reversal of, of the war. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, okay, okay, yeah. So that's of course, um, that's of course a very interesting point. And um, so many th things to say with regard to that. Um, so, so for one thing, I surely agree, right? I mean, this is the thing that, um, you know, is so striking. Obviously, if you compare Thucydides with Herodotus, um, this whole dimension of the gods that intervene in life, or even if it's, you know, even if it's put more uh, as a more remote power in Herodotus at times, right, to Theon, um, still, that's just not there in Thucydides, right? Um, and so I guess I would agree that when he alludes to tragedy in these passages that I showed and, and is sympathetic to this tragic insight that, you know, things have their, um, you know, things are not one dimensional and uh, they have a flip side and the and the very good things can have a terrible flip side and so on right um that doesn't mean um that he is committed to you know the explanation that the gods are behind that and that the gods bring down i don't know those who are who are successful or or the the the, pr the, the proud or whatever so i doesn't seem so i agree with all that yeah? Um, now, at least for all we can tell, right? Because Thucydides is silent about these things, right? Um, he doesn't clearly say, yeah, I don't think the gods intervene. Or he does not say, I do not think the gods intervene in, uh, in human affairs. Uh, quite unlike Herodotus, right? Who says very obviously that the gods intervene all the time. Thucydides, so Thucydides does not say, he, he doesn't take a clear stance, but that's, you know, uh, the impression you get from his account that the gods are not, if they exist, they are not a, the, the, a decisive factor. Okay, now come my qualifications or, or, or uh, you know, further thoughts. So what do I, what do I have in mind with the, the, the fate in the title? Um, so with that, I don't have in mind fate in the sense of a divine power. But you know, I have something like the, this um, uh, this uh, uh, phrase by Heraclitus in mind that um, you know, um, daimon, and that can be translated right at times as fate. Um, a, a character is for the the human person his daimon, and reversed. Fate manifests itself in character, right? So, um, you know, fate in that sense, that's something, you know, like, like Athens with this, this strong striving that they have in themselves, that it's very hard to avoid something, you know, that they get involved in such, um, you know, catastrophic adventure 
as the Sicilian expedition that seems somehow to be in their character. And that is something like their fate. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be, that would be that point. And then, okay, final, final issue, or that's now really the qualification. It is interesting that, um, you know, as scholars have noted in the Sicilian expedition, there are, um, more references to the gods and the divine sphere, um, or let's say allusions to it, than anywhere else in Thucydides, right? Never in the way that he says, okay, the gods intervened. But of course, it starts with the, the, the sacrilegious, right? The, 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 the destruction of the herms and the profanation of the mysteries. Then there's the important moment when the Athenians, okay, they finally convinced Nicias that they really should retreat and they could still retreat, right? They have, they still have it in their power. Then suddenly there's this eclipse of the moon and Nicias says, okay, no way I'll retreat. And right. So of course, um, uh, and then, and then also during the Athenian defeat, you have many passages the battle in the Great Harbor in Syracuse, and then also when they when they do finally retreat, but then it's too late, where Thucydides uh, mentions how uh, you know individuals appeal to the gods, and Nicias himself does it in his um, in his final speech uh, that he gives. So it is interesting that unlike in I'd say uh, you know more, all other extended sections of Thucydides there is this constant concern with, you know, the sphere of religion and the divine in the Sicilian expedition, in his description of the Sicilian expedition. And you could always say, okay, some things, of course, he has to mention. He has to mention the, the, the mysteries and the herms. But, you know, for example, I mean, these, these, um, these appeals to the gods that I just mentioned in the, you know, when, when they basically defeat has become inevitable, um, that seems to be really his choice. Yeah? And as far as I can tell, you don't find that in other, at least not to that extent, in other battle uh, or, or, or accounts of the war, of you know, events in the war in Sicilies. So that would be my terribly long answer. Yeah. But... Thank you. Thank you very much. Quindi vediamo se c'è qualche altra domanda. Okay, I think you can find some a uh, few a couple of questions in the uh, in the chat. Okay. Mm. okay, 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 okay. So I'm yeah, I'm not. Oh, the chat is up here, right? I'm not so used to okay. this. Form, Did so you yeah. find it? Yes. Yeah, I can we see it. Two questions. So I just let me read them. Uh, Roman and Greek historiographers meet with Polybius, but there's also a connection with the great Tacitus. Would you like to make a brief comparison between the three visions of fate? Okay, 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 okay. yeah, yeah, a big and interesting question. Um, well, I did, I did, you know, maybe, maybe if I just focus, if I just focus on the parallel with, uh, with Tacitus, um, you know, there is, of course, I mean, for one thing where you can where you can immediately compare them is um, is this kind of the skepticism and you know might even say the pessimism that they both that I mean right that Thucydides and Tacitus have. With Tacitus, it's more outspoken. Um, with Thucydides, more restrained. But from both of them, you get the sense that um, with uh, you know human beings. Um, there's, you know, <laughs> things can only go well for so long. Yeah. Um, and of course the difference is that Tacitus, and that's of course, it's a different world of the, of the, of the Roman court and the Roman empire that he is so interested or that he must be interested in what goes on in the court and also in the private psychology of the emperors and the dynamics of the imperial family. Um, and also, you know, all, all these kinds of things. And it's, it's, it's one of the striking things about Thucydides um, that he, you know, he, he brings in these private individuals and, and their, kind of, their, their, their kind of private concerns and the, the, the quirks of their personality much, much less. 
Um, and, you know, in, he and the Sicilian expedition, we have it a bit, right? We have it with, with Alcibiades and also somewhat with Nikias. But in general, he's very distanced when it comes to, you know, the private lives of these individuals, right? I mean, for example, I mean, who knows? I mean, uh, right? Uh, uh, um, Plutarch tells the story that he fell out, uh, that Alcibiades fell, fell out with the Spartans because he seduced the wife of the Spartan king. Uh, now, who knows? Maybe that story was made up in the meantime, um, you know, between Plutarch and Sisyphus, of course, a long time. But Sisyphus does not mention anything like that, right? He doesn't even, he just says, okay, the Spartans became suspicious of him. Yeah. So um, there is this kind of, um, mm, there is this kind of skeptical vision about 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 you know human beings and also things being fated i guess and whether you anchor fate in some sort of uh, transcendent force or in just the constitution of human beings to you know to end badly i suppose one has to say so that's surely shared by tacitus and Thucydides. but as i said right then there are these these differences really in you know how much that their presentation of individuals, I would guess. Yeah. Um, now, since I see that there are further questions, um, I uh, I may yeah, I may move on to them. Yeah. Yeah. Th there is a further question. Um, okay, Laura, say thanks. Um, the second question was: Do you think that the way to see this tells us tell us about opposites in Athens during the war and the plague, and in the social life of the city? Is something unique in the region of his historiographical work, or it is inspired by other authors? That was the question. And then um, Dario Zucchello quoted the fragment you, you quoted before in Greek, Ethos Anthropoi Daimon, uh, with the Italian translation, yeah. Yeah. Heraclitus fragment you quoted before. The question was about. Yeah, excellent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I also, I do see the chat now. I managed to, to, to open it. So thanks. Um, Okay, so um, let me think about. So, you know, I guess you could say that um, I mean these ideas about the 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 uniqueness of um, Athenian life and. Um, also, this interest in the combination of opposite dispositions. Um, I mean, I don't think it's it's unique to Thucydides, right? You also you can find traces of it, for instance, in um, you know in 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 tragedy, uh, uh, in um, in Euripides. Um, you have. Uh, um, Right. I mean, for example, I mean, this is a, a only preserved in fragments, but um, I believe it's Euripides' Antiope, um, uh, right, where you have the two brothers, and one of them stands for the active life, and the other one uh, stands for the contemplative life, and you know, and there you also you you can see these you you can see how they think in these oppositions, and the, I guess the the, the possibility or the risk that these fall apart. But also that you know, if they come together, they create something like a greater whole, and um, and also, right? I mean, I always think Greek sculpture, uh, or not least Athenian sculpture. That's why I read um, with the. I mean, that's of course not Athenian, but the 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 Doriforos. I mean, these principles of 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 balance and harmony, and I guess balance and harmony. You know, the, the, I, I think the important idea is always, it's not some sort of, mm, yeah, okay, so middle ground, neither here nor there. It's powerful forces that by interacting with each other, each come into their own, right? Each day, they kind of stimulate each other and then they create this, this greater fullness. Um, so, you know, as I was saying, I'm referring to, 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 to sculpture. These, I think these ideas are also there in um, in other uh, uh, Greek uh, or specifically uh, kind of Athenian 
monuments or, or sources from the time. Um, I just had another example that had come to my mind, but now it's escaping me. Um, but okay, what I think is, um, you know, and it's of course also what is also the case that, you know, in the in the modern era, um, when uh, I'd say especially in the early nineteenth century, when this um, admiration for Greece was very um, intensely felt, right, and with these people like I know Humboldt or Schiller and so on, that's what they admire about the Greeks, right? This idea, and um, I always think the the best text to show that this is also how the Athenians, at least in part, thought about themselves is the funeral oration. So there's, I think, no document, I would say, as clear about that, uh, or, or where these ideas are articulated as clearly as the funeral oration. Yeah? Now, the great paradox is that it's Thucydides where we, where we have this, because um, in, you know, it's if if you want to um, this kind of how can I put it? this positive, very positive vision of Greece as a kind of as, as a peak and as a as a fullness of uh, human potential. Um, you know, you might think of Plato, or you might, or of course, then also Aristotle. He was the one that I was thinking of, of course, though he is of course much later. But you know, with virtue as the mean. Um, that's that's I think also very much thinking along these lines. Um, so, but the thing is, Thucydides, in a way, his work is so dark, right? Um, it's uh, I, I'm always I you know if you look at Schiller and Humboldt, uh, uh, Thucydides is not the author they quote, right? Um, because the, the 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 emphasis, the overall emphasis of the work is on much darker aspects and it's also right it doesn't have it often doesn't have this kind of um ease um and um maybe also you know you could say things like elegance grace that many other greek works have even if they deal with you know gloomy topics like greek tragedy yeah? but Thucydides is very very stern um so i always think it's an amazing paradox that it's in this work that you know you also have this uh, most um, th this kind of um, clearest celebration of Greece that has been preserved, or of Athens, I guess, um, that has been preserved in uh, in the extant sources. And of course, now that's you could say another coming together of opposites, right? You have in Thucydides, you have the this dark awareness of fragility. And uh, and you know the th all the things going wrong, but then you also have then you also have this light that falls on this that 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 you have in the funeral oration, and you have again antitheses interacting with each other. Okay, and probably we have a few minutes, uh, one one or two minutes for the last question. Ho visto una mano alzata. Francesco, prego, Francesco Rigamonti. Thank you. So I have a doubt about the Sicilian expedition, especially the final part, when the Athenians could have chosen the retreat that I deduced was like the best option, but they didn't for this strong attachment with gods. So can we say that the Athenians, because of their religion, did prefer respect, uh, did prefer to um, uh, uh, maintain the respect, uh, didn't break the respect for the gods instead of a strategical choice, so the retreat, that could have changed maybe perhaps the sort of the Peloponnesian war? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, sure. I mean, um, you know, so I'd say um, Thucydides thinks that uh, they really made a mistake in not uh, retreating. And uh, right, he has this famous phrase where he says, you know, when Nikias, after the eclipse of the moon, um, uh, when Nikias refuses to even debate a retreat any longer for, you know, whatever time the soothsayers prescribe, 
um, Cecilia says, well, Nikias, he was a bit too much given to divination and things of that sort. Yeah. So Thucydides does seem to suggest that, okay, a retreat would have been the right thing there. And, you know, uh, that Nik Nikias was really too scrupulous. Um, on the so okay that's 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 one thing that i would say um now the thing is i always have the sense when i read that that somehow it's not very athenian what's going on here right um sure the athenians they uh you know as i as i said in the funeral oration and so on they they uh, they enjoy festivals and and sacrifices and they respect the unwritten laws but um is it really part of the Athenian character, as we see it in Thucydides up to that point, that they have this, you know, you could say superstition, or that, you know, when basically, you know, the practical choices are clear, they suddenly jump at the sphere, at the, at the remote uh, divine sphere, and uh, base their actions on that? So to, I have the sense that this is rather untypical of the Athenians, if we take the work as a whole but it's not untypical if we just look at the at the sicilian expedition um it starts with um already before they leave right there are these problems um with uh, the the sacrileges that then lead to the recall of alcibiades and so on and one does get the sense that the athenians as soon as they put foot at, on sicily they lose some of their, um, you know, their, their most salient characteristics, especially those that make them so successful in things like war, right? I mean, uh, you know, if you think of the speech of the Corinthians in book one, where they, uh, where they give their characterization of the Athenians and they say the Athenians are always so active and um, resolute um, and they, 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 they are so fast. But at Sicily, as soon as they land there, there's hesitation, right? They don't go straight to Syracuse. Well, Nikias doesn't want, but Alcibiades also doesn't want. Lamachos is the only one who wants to go straight to Syracuse. And then, and then that, right, it, it, it continues. Um, there are, I, I would say, the hesitation and then uh, also this theme of what you might call superstition. Those are the two strongest elements where the Athenians at Sicily, somehow seem to have lost, uh, you know, traits that have been crucial so far. And then it's interesting that as soon as Sicily is over, they seem to come back, right? Once, so at the beginning of book eight, um, when uh, you know all seems lost, then they, then they are, they, 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 you know, they recover, or um, they, they, they are much better at pulling up resistance at that point that anybody else in the Greek world expected, says Thucydides. And they also write, then there are also um, oracle mongers and so on, but they don't seem to be irritated by them. They, they try to build a new fleet as fast as they can. So it seems as soon as Sicily is gone, it's like as if a kind of evil spell has been taken from them. OK, I, thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> OK, sure. Just one little effort for us. <laughs> Um, there's a question in the chat, if you can see it. But yeah. I think that the questions are for students. We may uh, we may read us even if the time is a little bit over. It's a, she's a former student of mine, so I'm very proud of it. Do, do you want to read the question? Oh, okay. We said that to see this has a realistic way to analyze history, and because of this, he also admits that humans are driven to act in a specific way because of some principles that are always in the same avarice, for example. Do you think that once he realizes that these principles are, he also gives a moral judgment, what these principles are, he also gives a moral judgment, or he tries to be a critical? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, okay, this is, uh, this is, of course, also, this is very interesting. Um, so, you know, I think it's, I think it's mixed, but at the end of the day, you know, if we if we ask the question like, um, 
is he is he a moral thinker or is he somebody who just looks at the world and says okay these is this is how things are like you know sometimes it may be deplorable sometimes we may say oh this is admirable but you know without kind of imposing moral categories that are very strong i'd rather tend towards the latter right so i would rather tend you know towards him being okay we in the peloponnesian war we basically see what reality is like we see um we see you know as going back to my example of eros what this can achieve what this can be at its highest but it, we can also see what disaster it brings does this mean then you know and i think a moral step would be okay we need now to um basically figure out how we can restrict errors or, or somehow do something to shape it so that these things don't happen again. I don't see, at, at least in, in that part of the work, I don't see that so much with him. It's more what I would say is his, the, the tragic character that he says, okay, you just have both. This is what the world is like. This is what human beings are like. Um, things can go well for time, but you know, strong forces can go either this way or that. And um, it's ultimately maybe even beyond our control, right? So a bit like um, in the uh, in the Antigone where there is nothing, there are many things that are denos, but nothing is uh, uh, more denos than, uh, than human beings. Okay, so that's one thing. Still, you know, I, I said it's mixed, right? Um, and I'd say if you look, for instance, at the um, excursus on Stasis, right, book three, uh, chapter 82, 83, right, this famous, uh, when he talks about Stasis at Corsaira, but then it affects the whole Greek world, and he talks about language changing, right, and shifting, and um, um, about, um, you know, the Greek world being shaken, right, he recalls kinesis from the proem, I think there we do get the sense that he thinks, okay, preserving um, certain a certain moral basis um, is kind of important. If 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 you want, if 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 that falls away, um, you know, you just everything evaporates and you end up in stasis and these terrible crimes that are committed, right? And there we do get moments where we get this, where at least I get the sense that he you know he um of course always in his distanced manner but he kind of you know deplores that um you know things like human and divine law also in the plague of course you have it uh, are no longer accepted uh, and these kind so right so that there is awareness that um if you want to call it morality that this is important to life what i don't think is that he offers us lessons how you know, morality can be, I don't know, sustained or what we can do if we want to make sure that, you know, we are, we are uh, virtuous people, something like that. Okay. Okay. Benissimo. Quindi direi che controllo, non controllo, se non ci sono altre domande, Ringraziamo ancora molto Tobias per, per aver accettato l'invito e aver tenuto questa lezione che evidentemente ha suscitato anche una, un certo interesse ed è stato uno sforzo sicuramente ma molto costruttivo per tutti anche per lui perché so bene che nonostante la possieda perfettamente parlare in una lingua che, eh, che non è la propria a lungo è una, costituisce un certo sforzo e quindi grazie ancora e grazie anche a tutti i colleghi e i ragazzi che si sono mostrati, e gli amici naturalmente, i soci ai CC, e partecipi e presenti numerosi. Grazie, allora diamo appunto, ringrazio anch'io Tobias e do appuntamento a venerdì prossimo alla notte del classico tra le 16 e le 20, potete collegarvi a vostro piacimento e a breve il programma dovrebbe essere messo sul sito, ho già fornito copia alla nostra animatrice digitale. Arrivederci a tutti. Ok, grazie, arrivederci. <ride>
Poi chi volesse il PowerPoint di stasera io ce l'ho, soprattutto per i colleghi, lo posso, lo posso inviare. Buonasera a tutti. And you know, if anybody, if I may just say that, if anybody still has a question, uh, you can always send me an email, right? You, you find me, if you Google my name, you find me on the website.